Before we read our scripture lesson this morning, which is from Titus chapter 3, verses 8 through 14, we're going to pray that the Lord would help us to speak the word well, to receive it as we should, and to put it into practice. So let's pray aloud this prayer of illumination, saying, Blessed Lord, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord from Titus 3, beginning at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful." He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Amen. Well, last time we were in Titus, we heard the simple gospel message that God saves sinners. God saved us, Paul says, through regeneration, through justification, and through adoption. That is to say, he brings dead sinners to life, he declares guilty sinners righteous, and he gives alienated sinners a place in his family. In verse 8, Paul continues his thought with a fourth key word of salvation, and that word is now sanctification. The word isn't found in this text, but the idea of sanctification is explicit. Believers must devote themselves to good works. Or as Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, believers are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, so made new creatures, regenerated, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Sanctification, we could say, putting it very simply, is that process by which we are made useful in God's kingdom, for God's kingdom. Good works are contrary to the evil works that we commit when we live according to the flesh, like those described in Titus 3.3. 3. Remember that real dark verse in uh, chapter 3, verse 3, we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, and all the rest. Very dark verse. Good works are contrary to those works, those works of the flesh. But here, Paul contrasts good works with a single evil work, namely divisiveness. Devote yourselves to good works, he says, but avoid foolish controversies. This is, this is how Paul is applying the uh, reality of sanctification as a result of 
regeneration, justification, and adoption. Good works, he says, are profitable, but foolish controversies of divisive people are unprofitable and worthless. So clearly, just by the, the close linking of these concepts and the uh, parallel phrases that Paul uses, he's contrasting good works with divisiveness. Paul uh, paid this compliment to a man named Onesimus after he became a Christian in uh, Philippians, uh, Philemon 1 verse 11. He says, now he is indeed useful. That's a play on Onesimus' wor- uh, name in the Greek, but he's now become useful. He's become converted and now useful. And so we want to ask this question this morning and work with God's Word to answer it. How should Now, going back to last time, how should regenerated, justified, adopted believers live so as to be useful in God's kingdom, useful for each other? And so that's what we want to explore this morning, how to be useful. And there are two simple answers that the apostle gives to us, and they are related, as we'll see uh, this morning. First of all, he says, you want to be useful? Do good. Do good works. Devote yourselves to good works, he says in verse 8, and then again in verse 14. Do good. Practice good works. Good works are the evidence of sanctification. Um, Or as one of our theologians put it, Uh, sanctification is that gracious and continuous operation of the Holy Spirit by which He purifies the sinner from the pollution of sin, renews his whole nature in the image of God, and enables him to perform good works. So we're enabled to perform good works by the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification. So, Um, because we've been born again, we are now able to do good works. This is very important for us to recognize because there is a strain in uh, certain uh, uh, theological circles that says we're not able to do good works. You know, there's there's nothing that I can do, right? But, But the Bible says that because of regeneration, that spiritual rebirth, because you've become a new creature, you can actually do good works. It's wrong for us then to, uh, to take texts uh, like Psalm 14, verse 3, and others that Paul quotes in Romans chapter 3, uh, which says, there is none who does good, no, not one, and say, well, there it is. I can't do good works. Now, of course, Paul is, and, and the Old Testament authors whom he quotes, is describing the natural state of humanity. The fool who... Uh, Psalm 14 is written about the fool who denies God can do no good. That's a fact. But the same passage also speaks of the righteous. Verse 5 of Psalm 14, God's people whom he has redeemed for good works. So there are the workers of iniquity who can do no good, and there are God's righteous redeemed people who actually can do good works. So no, no, you know, none of this excuse that we say, well, you know, no one can do any good, no, not one. Yeah, if you're a fool, if you haven't been born again, but we're a new creature, the Bible says. And good works, then, are how we practice saving faith as those who have believed in God. That's how Paul qualifies it in verse 8. Those who believe in God uh, must be careful to devote themselves to good works. So, to understand good works, uh, just consider the two words in that phrase. What is a good work? Well, it's good, and it is work. Good works, Paul says, first of all, are good for other people. Verse 8, good works are excellent and profitable to people. This is very important. Um, they, are, they are fruitful. They meet the, the, the urgent needs of others. Good works, in other words, is not code for mystical, personal spirituality. It is a straightforward phrase describing how we must help other people. 
good works must be good. They must be useful. They must be profitable. They must meet actual needs. We can't just say, call it, you know, say, well, this is just, you know, it's just sort of a spiritual way of referring to how I, you know, how I uh, live and breathe as a Christian, and I'm just constantly sort of implicitly doing good works. No, they must be useful. Here's one example that Paul supplies in the text. Verse 13, the church was to receive and then send out again Zenos and Apollos lacking nothing. Now they're, they're, in other words, they're coming on a journey, um, not able to pack things in vehicles like we do when we go on a journey. Um, they're, they're dependent on the hospitality of the saints. So they come to the church, um, and they're going to head on again to another mission. And Paul says, you make sure that they are lacking nothing. That's an example of, of a good work. The, the actual people from the church at Crete were going to bring things to, the, to the, some, some church gathering to supply Zenos and Apollos so that they could go on lacking nothing. That's a good work. It's not, it's not ethereal. It's not mystical. Um, it's not implicit. It's real and actual, tangible. In doing actual, practical good for others, we, we mirror Jesus. You know, one of the, one of the best compliments that uh, the, uh, uh, the author Luke could pay to Jesus is what he says in Acts 10, verse 38. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And that's what Jesus does, isn't it? When you watch him in the Gospels, he's, he's going about doing good. He is active. Uh, he's meeting real needs. He's preaching the gospel, but he's doing so in a way uh, that, uh, it, that is complemented by real good works. He supplied food. He repaired broken body parts, even those parts that we might declare, you know, not fully essential. Uh, you know, someone could get along with some of the ailments that, that people had. He repaired these parts. He, he taught people how they could flourish in this age and in the age to come. So good works, just by that, that two-word phrase, uh, are good. They're useful, profitable, verse 8. But, but secondly, they require work. They are work. Good works are work. Uh, Christians, uh, Paul says in verse 8 and also again in verse 14, must be careful to devote themselves to good works. Christ is redeeming a people, Paul has written previously in chapter 2, verse 14, redeeming a people zealous for good works, not casual about good works, not occasional in good works, but zealous for good works. Zeal is a real powerful word, isn't it? Zeal has to do with consuming enthusiasm. It is passion. Zeal is eagerness. It is nothing like going through the motions out of a bare commitment to duty. What are you zealous about? What excites you? What are you passionate about? Your neighbor can probably answer that question for you. Is it good works? Is it, is it blessing the people who come into your life? That is absolutely true for, for God's people. And, and we're so thankful for the examples that we have around us. But we keep testing ourselves on that question. What is my passion? What am I working at? What am I wearing myself out doing? Is it good works? Or something less noble? Jesus was zealous for good works. He says this, a very... Uh, uh, memorable picture that he paints in John 2, verse 17. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Ever know anybody who's been eaten up by zeal? It's like he's been cons he or she's been consumed by some passion. Jesus says, zeal for your house, zeal for doing good, zeal for promoting the reputation of God for the benefit of others has eaten me up. Jesus wants us to be like him in working at good works and not for the reason that hypocrites do good works. Hypocrites do good works to be noticed by people. They have their praise. It's not from God. It's from others. Christians, like Jesus, do good works to glorify God, to love their neighbor, and to validate the gospel. So 
doing good works is Paul's first application of the gospel. In other words, if the the text that we studied last week, uh, verses 4 through 7, is one of the clearest, crispest, most powerful summaries of the gospel, then this is how Paul is applying it. The first way that he applies the gospel as he's teaching on sanctification is do good works. Look for opportunities, look for needs, and fill them. Be proactive, be eager, be zealous to maintain good works. One way that rejuvenated, regenerated, justified, adopted believers become useful is by doing good. But there's a second way that the apostle teaches on here And the second way that we are useful in God's kingdom has to do with how we handle controversy. So in two words, you could say, uh, how do you be useful? First of all, do good. Second, be peaceful. Do good and be peaceful. Be peaceable. In in the first part of the chapter, Paul contrasted good works with an evil, with with the kind of evil that's often done outside of the church. You know, people are, uh, in in verse 3, hating others, being hated by others, slaves to passions and pleasures. He's describing the the tragedy of unbelief and, and the life outside of God. But here, beginning in verse 9, through through 11, he contrasts good works with an evil that is too often done inside the church. And we know he's addressing the church here because he gives instructions in terms of how to discipline church members who are guilty of the sin. What is the sin that Paul has in mind? Well, in verse 10, he's warning against folk who stir up division who stir up division. The King James here has the word heretic, but the the problem uh, that Paul's addressing here isn't with false teaching. It isn't really with theological heretics. The, the, The problem that Paul's addressing is the problem of elevating conflicts over inconsequential matters to the level of agitation that should arise over real heresies. In other words, what Paul is saying is he's he's not really addressing heresies. It's not really the best word to translate those whom Paul is addressing here. But he's addressing those who treat far less consequential matters as if they were heresies. So it's an interesting word that the King James uses here. It's actually traced back to the to the Greek word that's, that, that sounds like heresy, that actually we get our word heresy from, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best translation. But basically Paul is saying you, you're, you're treating people like heretics uh, for being on the other side of an opinion with you. Paul is warning against overly opinionated folks. He's warning against agitators. Divisive people invest themselves in what he calls foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. One commentator uh, explained what that means in this way. Jewish rabbis spent their time building up, listen, imaginary genealogies for the characters of the Old Testament. Now, that's profitable. The Bible doesn't say who's related to who, but you just make up. That's what he's talking about here. The Jewish scribes spent endless hours discussing what could and could not be done on the Sabbath and what was and was not unclean. And what Paul is saying is that quarrels over such matters are stupid. He says they're foolish controversies. Now, of course, uh, some controversies demand our attention. But wise people quarrel over major matters in a way that admirably displays love for God and others. That's not what Paul's talking about here. He's, he's, uh, not, you know, he's, he's not saying you should never get involved in a controversy. 
but he's warning against agitators. Uh, Paul, I, as far as we can tell from the Bible, followed this counsel. He never looked for a fight. In fact, he often passed up a fight. He teaches us to pass up fights in Romans 14 and other places. Um, he, he only openly opposed the apostle Peter when he saw, in his own words, that his conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Galatians 2, verse 14. Now, now that is a controversy to enter into. That's worth fighting over. When someone is, is behaving in such a way which is contrary to the gospel, that opposes the good news of Jesus Christ. They're no longer being a gospel minister. They're being a gospel opponent. So that's the sin that the Apostle Paul is addressing here. Um, how should the church respond to this kind of, a, 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 of behavior? Well, listen to verse 10. After warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Warn him. If, we're, if, if many of us are honest, we'd have to admit that is the very last thing we want to do with a divisive person because they're divisive, <laughs> you know, because they're good at creating fault lines. Uh, who wants to warn such a person? Who wants to instantly be on the wrong side of a fault line? We know how divisive people will receive the warning. They'll receive it the way a fire receives gasoline. Um, who, who wants to be in that position? Who wants to, you know, have that, 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 that blowback? But what Paul is saying is that's not your problem. It's understandable why we'd be concerned, why we'd say why we wouldn't want to warn divisive people, but, but the way they blow back isn't your fault, isn't, isn't your problem. We can't ignore or try to appease argumentative people. They must be warned, right? It's not a, it's not a biblical tactic to ignore divisive people or to try to appease them. In the place of a third warning, God's people should simply stop spending their energies on people who demonstrate an inability to stop quarreling. God is saying, your, your life is too valuable to be spent wasting your energies on divisive people who have demonstrated by a lack of heeding two warnings that they're not interested in changing. So he's not, he, he's, not, he's not prescribing, at least at this point, excommunication for divisive people. I mean, that would certainly follow, uh, according to Matthew 18. But he's saying, have nothing to do with such a one. Stop investing your energies into someone who is just plain committed to being argumentative. Why is Paul so strong? Why is it that the same apostle who writes that we should bear with the weak is so strong against divisive people? Of course, it's not Paul, it's the Spirit, but you know, Paul's writing these things. Why is he so strong? Because quarreling in the church is disastrous. It's disastrous. People who unnecessarily break peace are sinful, Paul says in verse 11. They are sinful. And, and listen to how another place in Scripture helps us understand the sinfulness of quarreling. In Romans 13, after stressing love as the fulfillment of the law, Paul warns against participating in orgies and drunkenness and quarreling and jealousy. Quarreling and orgies have nothing to do with either. Paul says. He's willing to put both of those sins in the same category of things we must not participate in who walk in the light and not in the darkness. So, you know, quarreling is not a minor matter. They're sinful, Paul says. And because controversialists, until they repent and submit to Jesus, are not teachable. They're like a house that's so decayed, it cannot be restored. One of my kids and I were at such a property yesterday, and uh, it was a house that had burned up, uh, and just the, just the shell, just a few studs were left up. Um, not restorable. 
That's actually the meaning of Paul's word for warped in verse 11. Such a person is warped. Probably it's not really strong enough of a word that the ESV uses here. It's, it's so warped as apparently to be beyond uh, restoration. Further correction won't change their mind. They will always find another foolish controversy to stir up because they care more about their opinions than about the peace of the church. They quarrel instead of learning. Instead of listening, they quarrel. They are problem uh, uh, causers, not problem solvers. The fact that they are commonly embroiled in controversy suggests not that they are more convictional than others or that they happen to be more often in the right place at the right time when controversies arise, but that they search for them and create them. They're imbalanced and perpetually discontent. The kinds of fights they get into are proof that they are, in Paul's words, self-condemned, verse 11. Their own behavior demonstrates their condemnation. And why Paul gives limits to the patience of God's people in dealing with them. Appeasing arguers is to share in their folly. So strong words from the Apostle Paul on, on what it means to be useful. You want to be useful in God's kingdom as his redeemed and righteous people? Do good works and be peaceable. Do good works and be peaceable. It's not a hard formula. It's hard to practice. But it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, 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 a challenging formula. Now, uh, how, how do we put into practice the themes of our text? I wanted to close with three applications uh, from these two parts of what it means for us to be useful in God's kingdom. Number one, do not confuse arguing or even talking about spiritual things with true godliness. Don't equate, you know, spiritual talk and arguing with being truly spiritual. All right, we go back to what we read in uh, Matthew chapter 22 earlier this morning. The lawyer in Matthew 22 thought he was being godly by knowing the answer to a hard theological question. He thought he was godly. He thought he was in the position of the teacher, of the tutor, of the questioner. But Jesus' answer to the question is all about doing good works. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's the godly one there? Not the one who thought he was pious by knowing the, you know, being able to test Jesus, but the one who emphasized good works. Of course, some spiritual talk is necessary. Some perplexing questions are hard to avoid. Proper arguing can lead to truth. But our focus should be on doing what we already know to be true. Practicing the kind of religion that James says is pure and undefiled before God the Father, namely caring for the needy and resisting worldliness, James 1.27. You see, the people in, uh, some of the people in Crete thought they were the godly ones because they were talking about spiritual and biblical things, genealogies, uh, dissensions, quarrels about the law. And Paul says, that's not, that's not spiritual. Don't, don't confuse talking about biblical things with being godly. Listen to how John Calvin uh, puts this uh, so strongly. He says, in doctrine, we should always, now, you know, it's, it's risky to say things like always and never, isn't it? I always try to encourage our, our family, don't be very careful to say always or never. You're always mean to me. You never, blah, blah. Be very careful. Calvin was a careful man, but this is what he says. In doctrine, we should always have regard to usefulness so that everything that does not contribute to godliness shall be held in no estimation. 
We should always have regard in doctrine to usefulness so that everything that does not contribute to godliness shall be held in no estimation. The best alternative to unprofitable and worthless debates, and in our day, especially virtual debates, probably is to, is to do real good to actual people. All right, get off, get off the argument, you know, get out of the discussion room, and go do something good. Go, go help somebody. You know, don't deceive yourself into thinking that you're being saintly by arguing some position, you know, all by yourself in your, in your house somewhere, helping, actually really truly helping nobody. Do not confuse arguing or even talking about spiritual things with true godliness. Now, you know, there are other places in the Bible that talk about the need to, you know, in fact, in this very book, talking about the need to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine or whatnot. But in this text, that's what God is emphasizing. Number two, be very careful of any opinion which separates you from the fellowship of, of fellow believers. There will be convictions and opinions that separate from other believers. Be very careful. Be very careful of any opinion which separates you from the fellowship of fellow believers. Listen, Titus was commanded by God in verse 8 to insist on these things. That's what he says at the beginning of uh, verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. What things were, uh, was Titus supposed to insist upon? Well, the things he had received from Paul in the letter. There are other things that, that Titus thought about and heard about and knew about, but he should insist on these things. He must, this is Calvin, disregard other matters and teach those which are certain and undoubted to press them on the attention of his hearers to dwell upon them even if others talk idly about things of little importance. Titus was not to, was not to think about things of little importance. He was to dwell on the things that matter most. And that's true for us today as well. Listen, we all have quirky views there isn't a person in this room who doesn't have some odd view, you know, some far left or far right opinion, some idea that if, that if fully vocalized, people would say, huh, that's weird. We all have quirky views, um, and, and most of them are innocent enough if we keep them to ourselves. But, but let's refuse to confuse our quirkiness, our quirks, our oddities with matters at the heart of the faith, matters like those that are summarized by the Apostles' Creed. We should be far more argumentative about those things. The Apostles' Creed, for example. Uh, than we should about our quirks. To mask or not to mask, to vax or not to vax, to this or that, to not do this, to do that. There's all kinds of things that we have strong opinions on. But we are to devote ourselves to these things. Regeneration, justification, adoption, all these truths that God has been setting before us. When tempted to enter a foolish controversy, practice the spiritual discipline of smiling and changing the subject. Yeah, that's a spiritual discipline. To smile at somebody who is perhaps baiting you to jump in and waste your time and make yourself look stupid by entering a foolish controversy. One of the most spiritual things, godly things you can do in that moment is to smile and change the subject. Walk away. Go do something useful for God's sake. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful of any opinion which separates you from the fellowship of fellow believers as these fools were in Crete. They were stirring up division. They were insisting on things that were unprofitable and worthless. Number three, trust in the good works of Jesus, not your own. Now, it's, it, these verses, they're, they're all about the, the, the necessity of good works. And you must do good works. Do good, Paul's saying here, but don't trust in the good you do. 
do good, but don't trust in the good you do. Trust in the good that Jesus did. Trust in the good that Jesus is currently doing. And trust in the good works that Jesus will do. Jesus is the perfect doer of good works. He refuses to enter into useless quarrels. Weren't there several times recorded in Jesus' ministry when he said nothing? Wouldn't be drawn in. His life is the picture that this text describes in words. It's like this passage that we've read is the caption under uh, the you know the idea of of uh, the life of Jesus presented in the Gospels and the rest of the Bible. Trusting in the good works of Jesus is also the surest path to doing good yourself. Why is that so? Because faith is the open hand that receives Jesus. When we trust in Jesus, we're not just doing something with our minds, we're actually receiving Him and all of His benefits. Faith is our only connection to the good works of God which take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. Our obedience comes from confidence in Christ's obedience. Trust in the good works of Jesus, not your own. And, and, you'll, and you'll do good works. One uh, preacher applied this passage in this way. Those who preach morals without gospel, those who demand good works but lead us to neglect the good works of Jesus, Those who preach morals without gospel are like builders who begin to build on the second story. How would that work? You have to build the first story first. You can't build the second story up in the air. There has to be a first story. And the first story is the obedience of Jesus. We build on that by believing in the obedience of Jesus. And then we're able to build that second story of good works. Titus must keep insisting on the gospel so that God's people might be energized to get to work. So here's a simple formula for your sanctification, for your usefulness in the kingdom of God. Believe the gospel, get to work, and refuse foolish controversies for God's glory. Amen. Let's pray together. We worship you, Lord Jesus, the doer of the good works that have brought about our redemption. We thank you for doing what the law demanded and receiving the penalties for the law, that the law demanded for lawbreakers. We thank you for your active and passive obedience. And... We, in fact, we, we, we put ourselves entirely at the mercy of your active and passive obedience. We, we want to build our lives on that first story of the gospel so that we could do good works, to be zealous about good works, to check our priorities, and to refrain from foolish controversy. We pray that you would help that to be so among us. We thank you so much for the peace that you do give to us and the fruitfulness that is coming out of the lives of our brothers and sisters here. And we pray that it would increase more and more and that controversy would decrease more and more. To the glory of Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing now from Psalm 31.